Okay, when you're ready. <coughs> Welcome, New Bedford. This is Mike Sawyer from New Bedford Guide. We're here live in the studio with uh, four of your um, New Bedford School Committee candidates. Uh, it's been a long road. We're a few days away from the election. I want to mention you can um, vote absentee ballot this Saturday and, of course, Monday, or excuse me, Tuesday, November 7th, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Get out and vote. Don't complain on Facebook, okay? So we are here with your school committee um, candidates. You have incumbent uh, Josh Amaral. Um, we have uh, Richard Porter. We have um, Colleen DeWicke, and we have John Oliveira. So welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out here. Um, we're going to make it... If you have questions on Facebook, throw it out, and I'll look at asking them, but we're going to start just from left to right, make it very simple. Um, so, uh, Richard, so, Pia Durkin, you're on the school committee. Are you going to renew her uh, contract or not? Well, as I said in the, um, the debate the other night, I would be inclined to not renew her contract. Um, when I started this journey, um, I guess three months ago now, I know some people that teach in the uh, city schools, and I would hear comments of great concern. And I kind of thought, well, when I get out there and meet different people, you'll hear a variety of responses. And, and that was not the case. I spoke to new teachers, veteran teachers, retired, elementary, secondary, substitute teachers. I have yet to hear anything favorable. But my bigger concern is, which we've all talked about, is this exodus of teachers leaving the New Bedford school system. And not just teachers, administrators as well. Um, my background is I, I, I was a public school educator, for, um, a public school teacher for 18 years. I'm currently an assistant principal in an elementary school. And I see what happens when the administrator and the teachers stay in the building and invest in the community. Um, a positive culture happens. Um, kids get to know their teachers, family gets to know their teachers. That's how success and that's how great things happen. When in the middle of the year, I believe you're potentially up to three administrators that have left the district just since the beginning of September, that's a concern. Um, I was reading an article um, based on what um, Dr. Durkin said to WBSM. She was mentioning that she thought it might be because of professional development opportunities, compensation. I was saddened because she has to be reflective and say, what about the culture that I've created, this very much this boss management style? It doesn't work, it doesn't sustain, so no. I think it's time for Dr. Durkin to, um, to leave the school district. And I'll admit, I screwed up. We were supposed to do an intro. We're going to get this question through, and then we'll do a, actually an intro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Colleen? Sure. Yeah, I was wondering if I should introduce myself. So, Colleen, yeah, why, you, why don't we do an intro, and then um, sure. and we'll end back with you as your intro. But let's do an intro, and then tell me uh, about... Sure. Um, do you know, my whole intro Yeah, what well, you guys are okay with that? Everyone up there? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, right. let's do that. Sorry that you didn't get the chance to do it, no right, problem, but you'll, no problem. you'll get it on the back end. So I'm Colleen DeWicke. I'm running for school committee for four reasons. And because I watch a lot of Sesame Street, I'm thinking of it as the four Ps. Number one is I'm a parent. So I have a little one. He's one year old. And he will be in the schools by the end of the school committee's term. So I really feel an imperative to get involved right now so that I can feel confident about my commitment to send him to the New Bedford Public Schools. My second P is public service. So I have been committed to public service in New Bedford in a number of capacities. First, I've been the chair of the planning board. I've served in that role for over five years now. And I also co-chair the community preservation committee. So I've developed a lot of experience in public service in terms of how the city works and how it doesn't work and how it's important to both work together within a collaborative legislative body and also work across legislative bodies. For example, the school committee needs to have a good relationship with the city council, and in my experience on the planning board and on the community preservation committee, I've learned how to forge those strong working relationships that I think will be really valuable in this capacity. Number three is public policy. So I have a master's degree in public policy that I received from UMass Dartmouth, and in so doing, I learned a lot about education policy and applied my studies to understanding issues here in New Bedford. I also work in an urban policy role at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. So I work with a number of smaller industrial cities throughout New England, helping leaders identify, solve, uh, solve problems through collaborative leadership approaches. And the final P is that I'm really passionate about this. And you have to be. We were joking earlier that the pay for school committee is zero. There is no pay to do this work. We have to campaign citywide. So you really have to be passionate about it. And my passion is fueled through experiences like being a tennis coach for Fairhaven High, a JV girls tennis team, a camp counselor, a, um, a substitute teacher in the Fairhaven Public Schools during college, an urban environmental educator in the DC public schools, and uh, now it's coming full circle as a parent again. So I'm really fueled by the passion 
for education and the role it plays in really reversing our city's fortunes and giving access to economic opportunity to our kids. Okay, up next, Josh Shamrock. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Josh Amaral. I'm a current member of the school committee running for uh, re-election, my, my second term. Uh, four years ago, I was, I was lucky to be elected. I was the uh, youngest elected official in New Bedford's history. Uh, and now, uh, those four years have gone by in the blink of an eye, and I'm, I'm back here running for uh, re-election. Um, I, I do want to thank the Bedford Guide for putting this event on and, and the, the bevy of uh, forums throughout the, throughout the campaign season. It's been really informative, and um, I want to thank the viewers for paying attention to the election. So all politics are, are local and uh, it starts here and, and there's no more important issue locally, in my opinion, than our public schools. So um, I appreciate that we've been able to have that dialogue. Uh, the reason I'm running for school committee is um, I think that we've made some progress over the last few years. I'm, I'm proud of a number of things that we've been able to do, um, but I still see a need to do so much more. Um, you know, in many ways we've, we've shored up some weaknesses that the department had, but in doing so we've created new problems that, that we have to solve and that this next committee will solve. Um, I think I've done a good job. I think I've been a leader on the committee uh, for the important issues, and um, I'm looking forward to continuing that. This is, uh, you know, as I said, a very important election. Um, two other incumbents are not running for re-election. I'm the only incumbent running. Uh, and people at home that are going to vote on Tuesday, um, you get to pick three candidates. So uh, you'll choose three of us that are sitting up here, and uh, my hope is that you choose me and, and you know, obviously you choose two others, and that we can work together uh, to solve some of these issues. So I'm excited that there'll be a new school committee, but um, I think it's important to have someone with experience on there that can sort of lead the way and, and bring new members on. Thank okay. you all for me. Thank you. John Oliveira. All right, I'm John Oliveira. Um, I'm a former naval officer, lieutenant commander. Um, worked in the civilian sector as a merchant marine officer. Have um, a lot of uh, experience uh, in leadership areas, management, uh, bringing in different parties. Uh, I handled a lot of foreign uh, military uh, events and uh, missions. But the reason I'm running is for my children. And I am the only candidate who is on the school committee or running for the school committee that actually has kids in the school system. We haven't had a parent on the school committee with children in the school system for many, many years. I am the only one that hears on a daily basis about lunches, about kids getting arrested, about teachers getting assaulted, about having substitutes, the environment that we have created in our school system has become toxic to the point that it is affecting our children. And that is from, be from leadership on the school committee and leadership from the superintendent's office. And the further I have gone into this campaign and the further more I've talked to people, it's the same answer. It's Pia Durkin, it's MCAS, it's Common Core. I, I am not politically correct, I'm not a politician, I am the person that you need, that you, that you want up there, that's going to call BS when he sees it on the school committee, that's going to hold people accountable because nobody has on that school committee. They've refused and they have not held Pia Durkin accountable. You need someone that's going to step up to the plate and fight against MCAS, fight against Common Core. That is a fiduciary responsibility because you, you will elect one of us to represent your education uh, initiatives and what we need to do is we need to get school committee members that are willing to stand up for this you know the mayor has created a disaster here the school the school committee the, the state DSC was never ready was ready to take over our schools that was a made up that was that it was so made up they were not ready to come in and take over our schools anyways I look forward please vote for me on Tuesday November 7th Yep, so the rules, I won't cut you off, but if I raise my hand, just kind of do a closing. I remember we've seen some debates where you kind of get stopped. We don't want you to stop in your mid when you're talking. So, Richard Porter. Well, thank you, and thank you to New Bedford Guide and your viewers for this opportunity. We've been fortunate. We've had many opportunities over the past um, month or so, so this is great to have this one today. So my name is Rick Porter, and um, I'm a lifelong New Bedford resident. I'm a proud graduate of the New Bedford schools. 
And I'm also an educator, and as, as John was mentioning, um, he would be a parent. Um, I think there's been um, many years since there's been a building level educator on the school committee. Uh, I spent 28 years in education. For 18 years, I taught fifth grade. And for the past 10 years, I have been an assistant principal. So as I've been saying, it's not just passion for me. This is part of my professional career for almost 30 years. And that's the reason why I feel I'm qualified and ready to serve on, on the committee. So, as an educational leader, I have supported students by focusing on families and focusing on teachers. The job I do every day, I have to support families because we have to support their children, not just academically, but emotionally. And a school should be a place that families can turn to for support. So that is why it's so important that our, our neighborhood schools, whether they be small schools of 200 kids or larger schools, that they be places where people are investing and staying a long time because that's where families go for the variety of concerns that they have, not just about education, but about their kids. That's how I've done my job as, a, as an educational leader. But the other way I've done it is that to be a true champion for kids, you have to be there working with the teachers. Teachers need to make sure that they have the autonomy to do the job that they're doing. Because for a teacher, children are not numbers, they're not scores, they're not levels. They know that they're unique individuals that are in front of them, and they know that children have unique um, learning needs. So we need to have unique and differentiated approaches to their learning. We need to make sure that our central office administration, beginning with our superintendent, values, trusts, and respects teachers. And clearly, um, from my journey the past um, few months, that is sorely lacking. So my three points that I have here is that we need to make sure that our budgetary needs are prioritized to focus on actual student impacts and that the teachers have the flexible resources to meet the needs of all their students. We also have to recognize that we're educating the whole child. I use this phrase a lot because I see this every day. Many children come to school not available to learn. We have to address that first because a well-adjusted child today is going to be a productive citizen tomorrow. And lastly, like I said before, the respectful culture, we need to work on that. So I'd appreciate your support on November 7th. Okay, so Colleen, we asked um, Rick before uh, we went to the introductions. Pia Durkin, um, you're on, if you're voted onto the school committee, are you going to vote to renew her contract? So hiring, firing, and renewing the contract of the superintendent is one of the principal roles of the school committee. And what I've heard loud and clear in my campaign is that New Bedford is ready for a new direction in its leadership. And I think it's important to be strategic about how we move in that new direction. So the superintendent's contract is through 2019, June 2019. Um, it's important to note that many members of the current school committee extended that contract through that date. So ending that contract any sooner, I think, would be really irresponsible for a number of reasons. First of all, we have paid a significant amount of severance pay to previous superintendents in New Bedford. Those resources could have gone into our classrooms for smaller class sizes, for better resources for teachers. So I think if we don't have cause to break a contract, then we really need to start thinking strategically about what happens in July 2019 when we'd be ready to bring on a new superintendent. So what I'm really advocating for, the principal point of my whole platform here, is that New Bedford right now is without a strategic vision. We have not as a community come together to say, what does a better school system look like? What would have to be true for us to feel like New Bedford is moving in the right direction with our education investments? And what are the key steps that we're all going to take as a whole community to get there? So not just what is the responsibility of the New Bedford Public School District, but what are we asking the private sector to do? What are we asking the nonprofit sector to do? And how are we giving parents and teachers a way into making those decisions? I think everything hinges on our ability to come up with this vision and this plan because we can then use that to hire the next superintendent and say to that person, this is where we want to head. Are you willing and committed to take us there? And then we hold that person accountable. We say, this is what we needed to see for results, and are you achieving those results? So I think we really need to start having a very thoughtful process when this next school committee cohort is added to the mix. I think that conversation needs to start right away because it will take at least a year to come up with that vision and plan and really to make the compelling case to our next great superintendent that New Bedford is the place to take their leadership and invest in the future of our kids. Okay, Josh Amaral. Sure, uh, so uh, I'll say this, and this has been, this has been said of our schools um, for a while, and, and this year I think especially, um, that we've taken steps to get our schools from, from poor and, and unacceptable to okay or adequate, but the steps that we took to get from, from point A to point B 
aren't going to work to get us from okay or adequate to great, which is what we want, right? We want to have great schools. And I think along those same lines, you know, the strategies have to change, and uh, in many ways the, the people have to change, and that starts at the top of the organization. Uh, so uh, obviously Superintendent Durkin has been a polarizing figure uh, here in the city of New Bedford. People have very strong opinions about her, um, and, and that's been troubling, uh, especially in light of the fact that you see so many staff members uh, leave the district, and you hear you know some personal accounts of what it's like to work here, and I can only imagine the, the hit that the, the reputation of the district takes uh, when those stories are repeated ad nauseum a, across the state, uh, and that's a, the management tone that really starts at the top of the district. And I think it, you know if you watch school committee meetings, you pay attention to that sort of stuff. Um, I've shown that I have a track record of, of holding the superintendent accountable. Uh, we've got a performance evaluation system that, that grades out the superintendent every year, and I've, I've been critical at times when I think that that's warranted. Um, I've had frank conversations with the superintendent, and I think, frankly, uh, we have a difference of opinion in, in the direction of the district uh, going forward. My dream superintendent is someone that's capable of building consensus, that's a, a bridge builder, um, that's capable of, of leading in a, a really visionary way, um, and while Dr. Darkton has her strengths in, um, in the strategies in, in the classroom at times, or she's got strengths uh, in managing education policy, uh, I, I don't know that she's the right person to lead New Bedford in the way that I would like to see it led. Uh, so I think this next school committee, once we're seated, uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to make some major decisions. And that transition period needs to start immediately. John Oliver. Okay. Fire. That's what I've been saying all along, and that's what I'm going to continue to say. The school committee, when it sits, needs to, actually the sitting school committee now at their next school committee meeting needs to immediately get a committee in session to start looking at the search for a new superintendent. I will ask for her resignation, whether we got to pay, because I don't, unlike Colleen, I don't have three years to wait. Neither do parents that have kids in the school today. She needs to go. She is toxic for this city. She is toxic for this school system. It's not just about teachers. It is now about my three children that go to school. I don't have three years to wait, and, those, and pe parents who have kids in the school don't have three years to wait. And we have made steps. Josh, I think you used the term adequate. That's not satisfactory. She's been in here too long. And, you know, and on top of this, you know, Josh says, you know, that the management and this leadership style is from the top down. Well, that top starts with Mayor Mitchell and every single member of this school committee that has allowed this to continue. And it is time for change. It is time to get rid of Pia Durkin. It is time to get rid of Mayor Mitchell, Jack Nobriga, Jack Livermento, because I'm going to name names, because I am not one. If I see BS, I'm going to call it, and I'm calling it on all of them. Okay, so I'll add one rule to this. If you're named, you have up to a minute to respond if you'd like it or not. So you were obviously named, Colleen, so would you like to respond? Sure. I don't suppose I know how to defend myself for the fact that my child is one year old. Um, I think really a lot of my response in terms of how to proceed is related to the fact that another thing that we need to do as a community is to broadcast to the rest of the world that New Bedford is not the gang who couldn't shoot straight, that New Bedford is a thoughtful place where we are able to come together as a community and build consensus about where we want to go and how we want to get there. So I advocate for taking a really planful approach. I think the words ready and aim always have to come before the word fire. And that's why I think we need to start a productive dialogue about a positive vision for moving forward with a city. Josh, you're also named. Uh, sure, I'll just, I'll just comment. I think, I think my reputation speaks for itself in the community. People know that I've held the superintendent accountable, that I've been a, a vocal leader on the committee, um, and I think most people know my opinion of, of the direction of the school department and, and my feelings toward the superintendent. Uh, I haven't been shy about sharing them, and I think it's important for us to be honest about the issues that we have in our school department. We can't sit up there as a school committee uh, and say that everything's okay, and then we leave the meeting and we hear from five people on the way out of you know, this issue or that issue. I think in many ways our schools have made progress over the last few years, and I'm, I'm very proud of that, and I don't want to discount that. And I think at times uh, a lot is laid at the lap of Dr. Durkin that is really a result of poor education policy at the state and national levels. Um, she's not responsible for it all, um, but at the same time she is responsible for some of it, and as a school committee we're, we're in an important role where we hold that person accountable. So uh, I'll continue to do that, and I, I, I hope I have the opportunity. Okay, so next question we'll start with Colleen. Great. Um, so, New Bedford High School, the, um, 
there's been confusion on the web, and we did a um, fact check uh, recently that the graduation rate compared to the dropout rate, there was numbers out there thrown out there, 55 percent dropout, 6 percent dropout, which is totally false. It's about 12 percent. The numbers have gone up from about 61 percent to 7 percent graduation rate. And I looked at it to try to compare it to a, a similar city, Durfee High School is at 79 percent. So while we've had some pretty good progress, we're not quite at someone like Durfee. Um, how do we get to 79 percent? Sure. And another question, too, is what is the percent we need to achieve in order to feel satisfied that we're moving on the right track? So that gets back to my point about really setting expectations as a community. Um, so this question is really in my bailiwick because I was a fellow with the National Dropout Prevention Center, which is at Clemson University. And I had the opportunity to work on a really cool project in the city of Springfield where their dropout crisis was severe. And we were able to go into the schools in Springfield and also to community organizations to first of all learn about why dropout was such a prevalent issue in that city and then identify some strategies. So I think we need to have a conversation first of all about how much improvement do we need to see? What are the strategies we're using now and what's working? And a lot of the dropout prevention efforts actually re need to start really early. So you can see dropout risk showing up as early as kindergarten. If kids are missing school chronically, that absenteeism is going to persist and that is going to mean they're not in the classroom learning at the grade level and they're not reaching their third grade reading proficiency, which is a huge indicator for not only whether a child will succeed and graduate high school, but actually whether they'll be successful in life. So I think what we would need to do as a school committee and as a city is really assess, first of all, what's our goal? Where are we going to need to be to feel satisfied? And I think it's great comparing ourselves to other gateway cities is absolutely what we need to do because if Fall River can do it, if Brockton can do it, then New Bedford can do it. And the question is, why aren't we doing it now? So starting with that data, being really accurate in how we understand and use that data and unpacking our strategies is a great place to start. And this is an expertise that I'll bring to the school committee. Okay, so New Bedford, this is your school committee. Parents, this is your school committee. A lot of comments, but I want to see some questions. If you got questions, throw them out there, and we'll look at adding it if it's an appropriate question. So, Josh. Yeah, I'll start with this. I was disheartened to see the, the spread of the false information about the graduation about dropout rate at New Bedford High School in the last few days. In fact, I, I don't often do this, but I felt compelled to mix it up in the comments a little bit to provide some of the information, which is calculated by, by the state. It's on the up and up. Um, and I'm proud of the fact that uh, when I was a student in 2011, uh, the graduation rate was in the 50s, and now, uh, last year, the adjusted four-year graduation rate was 70.9%, uh, which is a huge increase, and one that many people told me w w was not possible here in New Bedford. So we've made progress, and I think the theme of the night is probably we've made some progress, but not enough, right? We've gone from poor to okay, but we need to get from okay to great, uh, and I think this is a good example of that. Uh, one of the things I talk about a lot is expanding the types of programs that we know work. So one major factor in the, the climb from 50% to the 70s um, is we've instituted a summer program where students that are just a credit or two shy of graduating can make those courses up over the summer. So they don't go through a whole summer, have to come back for a whole semester, a whole year, and we're able to keep those kids and keep them engaged in our programs. We also have a great uh, graduation facilitator team. These are the types of people that are going to kids' houses with alarm clocks and trying to get them up in the morning, get them to school because they have to value their education. Um, part of the reason Fall River and Brockton as urbans do a better job of us in retaining um, their students and keeping them so they graduate is that, uh, is that they have strong alternative programs. So instead of students dropping out or if students have disciplinary issues and they're just really not fitting in in school, uh, they're able to go to an alternative program that better meets their needs. We have an alternative program in New Bedford, but the, the slots are limited. Uh, so we'd like to expand those. I think that would be ideal. Um, and you'd be able to better engage those students. Not to mention we should pursue uh, vocational training opportunities at the high school. We see the success of VOC. Their graduation rate is significantly higher. Um, maybe if we, we had more classes, we taught kids trades, um, they would be better engaged in school. They would, they would find a way um, to stick around because they're looking forward to being there more than um, that same student might be in an algebra class where they, they might not feel like they're being engaged. So uh, I think it's all about expanding the programs that we already know work and uh, continuing to build upon the successes we've already found. Thank you. Okay, John Oliver. Yeah, yeah, you know, obviously that's an issue. And if you look at the various numbers that the, that the superintendent can throw at you as far as dropout rates and graduation rates, there's probably five or six different numbers she can throw at you. And so for me, it's, it, this is a numbers game. And I, I'm going to ask Colleen, because she, you mentioned a test, and I'm not sure what test was the, 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 the data that you get from third grade reading proficiency 
What, what, what test is that? What do we get that information from? Their grade reading scores? Yeah. MCAS evaluation. Oh, MCAS. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Because that is not how I want my child educated. The people I talk to, that's not how I want. They don't want their children educated by being able to take a bubble test. And the school committee, with the exception of Josh, who I know who has been up at the State House fighting, and Chris Carter, the rest of the members, including this mayor, continue to allow that. This 10th grade re requirement for graduation is ridiculous. Scott Lang had it right several years ago. And this mayor, and the school committee should be fighting to get rid of this now. You know, the testing tells you nothing, dear. Nothing. May I respond? Yeah, yeah, you're done. You're oh, sorry. I'm done. She can okay. respond. Okay, so you got a minute? Sure. Um, so I just want to ask my colleagues to think about one of the leading issues that we've heard as a concern about the superintendent which is the lack of warmth, collaboration, and empathy. And I just want to encourage all of us to manifest those values in this conversation because this is a conversation about our kids and about our city's future. And I don't want to sit here tonight and be attacked for bringing data to the table. I no, really want to see ourselves as collaborators who all really believe that we need to deliver a better education for our kids. So I just ask that we hold ourselves accountable to the values that we want being taught in our classrooms and exhibit it in our community. Okay, so you want to you mention, so um, Rick. So your question again was on New Bedford High School and the, the perceptions and myths potentially about the numbers and stuff. And it seems to me that you know, what you have done with New Bedford Guide is it sounds like you've come up with some accurate numbers. The graduation rate is improving, the dropout rate is declining, and that is all, that's great. But as a practicing educator, for me, it's always the story behind the numbers. A concern that I have is that we are really good as educators focusing on those children who are, are low performing and are high performing, but we sometimes get lost in those children like the middle of the pack. Um, we have to be very mindful. We have many students that will go to four-year colleges, those will go to community colleges, but we also have kids that will be on the career path and we have to look and see what's happening in New Bedford High. We talk about the fact that parents have to look for choices at school, which is why they sometimes go to charter schools, parochial schools. Parents should be able to see choice and diversity within New Bedford High, and that's something as a school committee person I like to see happen. My other concern, again, when you look at the story behind the numbers, is what are we truly teaching our kids so that they can be successful? I mean, John and I are probably the, the older gentlemen and, and ladies in the, the room here right now, but I mean, I couldn't tell you what my GPA was. I couldn't tell you where I stood at New Bedford High. I can tell you it was not as an honor student. But what I can tell you is that I was prepared for life. I was prepared for my college choices, my career choice. So are we making sure that children are being taught critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, real life application skills? Are we doing blended learning at the high school? Where we're, um, combining technology and traditional and real life experience with kids. Those are the questions that I would like to ask instead of just the numbers. But the other area that I have a real concern by is the stress level we're putting some of these kids on. We look at the issues of mental health, substance abuse. I am an assistant principal that has to talk to parents who sometimes are making decisions on extracurricular activities because of the amount of homework a third grader has. That's problematic. Colleen also brings up a good point about um, the early learning, and she's absolutely right. Early learners are a great indicator of what's going to happen later on. But we also need to make sure that within New Bedford that there's a dialogue between the elementary level, the middle level, and the high school level. So the child that's going up through our system is not lost just because they switch schools or switch levels. So those are, for me, the real issues. It's the story behind the numbers. And sadly, all I hear coming out of the central office seems to be numbers. Numbers are important, but numbers aren't the end of the story. Okay, so you were mentioned again, so if you'd like a minute, it wasn't really an attack, but... Oh, no, I'll just, I'll appreciate that Rick also understands the value of early education. It's something I've been talking about a lot because so few of our kids in New Bedford get access to preschool programs, and there's a huge demand. There are thousands of people, parents and kids, waiting to, to access early childhood preschool slots. So I think it's something we absolutely have to prioritize. Okay, so we'll do the next question, I believe starting with Josh. So. Big thing I find on social media, um, John brought it up a lot last night in the mayor debate, uh, discipline in our schools. So um, we find, usually it's in the middle schools where you start finding the bigger problems. Yep. Um, 
are we on the right path or what are some of the things we can do to resolve the discipline issues so the kids that are there to focus can actually focus? Yeah, well, so if you're building like a, a pyramid of needs at, at school, right, and, and talking about a pyramid of needs to build confidence in the schools, in the community, uh, it starts with safety, right? So we need to know at the very least that our kids are going to be in school and they're going to be safe and that students that are acting out or acting irresponsibly are going to be held accountable for those actions. Um, about, I guess it was two years ago now, uh, the school committee convened a, a subcommittee uh, that was looking at, at these things and tried to wade into the very complicated territory of, you know, how do we stay in compliance with state law, um, r respect people's civil rights, but also, you know, lay the law down in some ways and make sure that the kids know um, that they're going to be held accountable if they act out. Not for nothing, uh, I don't want to see any other kids' education disrupted or interfered with because one kid in the class is a troublemaker, right? At the same time, we want to be careful not to wade into um, you know, having zero tolerance policies where all of a sudden, you know, at the drop of a hat, a kid is shipped out of a school. I just heard this week that there, there was an incident at Keith Middle School uh, involving a student and a teacher and that sort of stuff. We can't have it. We just can't have it in our district. So uh, I'm always big to follow up to make sure uh, that those, those children, those students um, who are acting out in those ways are dealt with appropriately. Um, and oftentimes I'm pleased with the results. Sometimes I haven't been pleased with the results. And that's been a call from the committee to, to, to be more proactive about those things. Okay. John yeah, unquestionably, discipline's an issue. Uh, I, I was on the phone this morning with the principal at Keith uh, because I saw one child get cuffed Taken to the police station Monday, a teacher transported to the hospital after being injured in an altercation. I saw it, and my daughter reported an other student getting cuffed again yesterday. And that's an issue. And I'm sure Keith isn't the only one that this is going on at. And I put part of that, part of that blame on the retention and morale of our teachers. We can't provide consistency to our children. Our teachers can't get to know our children on a, on a solid basis if they're coming and going like a revolving door. So absolutely, children need to be held responsible for their actions. Parents need to be held responsible. Parents need to be engaged. Before it gets to the level of somebody getting arrested, we need to be on the phone with these parents, finding out what's going on. On a second note, I'm all about empathy, but I am about the voters understanding where we stand. And that means I stand against MCAS, and I do not use MCAS numbers to justify anything because I think those numbers are worthless. And I am not ready to go into preschool into third grade and spend more of our money when we can't even manage the budget we have or the staff we have. Thank you. Well, school safety and, and discipline of kids, it, it's, it, it's part of the work I do every single day. It's interesting. Um, when I start the year off, I go into the kindergarten classes and introduce myself. And for a five-year-old, what the role of an assistant principal is, they don't really know. But the one thing they do know, they know is that my job is to keep them safe. So for me personally, in my prof professionally, that is paramount. For me, it's a very black and white area. We need to make sure that happens there. In terms of discipline, I've said this before in our, in our debates, I was thrilled that New Bedford adopted the positive behavioral um, intervention system approach. And, and there have been some concerns because some people feel like it's, 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 a, it's a bribery approach. Other people feel it's an extra curriculum for our teachers. It really is not. It's really a mindset of how you manage your classrooms. And not just at the elementary level, but all the way up from middle into high school. And the idea is that, the proactive way, is that you're teaching behavioral expectations. We can't make the assumption that children are coming in knowing what's expected of them. We need to be teaching that for them. But there's also a reactive side to this as well too. We need to make sure that we're holding children accountable for their consequences. We just need to make sure that our consequences are consistent so children are confused on Monday this was acceptable, Tuesday this was not. But we also have to remember too, we are dealing with children. And when I say children, I'm talking about as low as pre-K all the way up to 12th grade. So we need to make sure that our system of discipline is not necessarily equal, but it is fair. But I, I do agree with what others have said. I mean, for me, the learning environment cannot be disrupted. That is sacred. We need to look at all our avenues that we have, either through alternative methods or whatever, to make sure that those who are habitual offenders are not interfering with the education of others, but yet also being mindful that we need to also be servicing them as well. I'll go back to what Colin has mentioned too, and I have said we also need to be looking at kids from pre-K all the way up to 12. There cannot be that gap, not with academics, and cannot be with behaviors. We should be real early having 
levels talk to each other. We talked about middle school. Are the Roosevelt, Keith, and middle school staffs getting together to talk? Those dialogues, those conversations are important. Okay, Colleen. Sure, so I'll do my best to not reiterate some of the great points uh, that you've heard so far, but I think certainly we have to start with a, a foundation of a safe, nurturing environment. That's so important to all of us as parents, and it's so important to teachers, being able to teach and move children along a path that they need to move to be learners and to be successful in school and in life, it starts with a safe environment. So creating a positive school climate has many dimensions, but I think the foundation of this ethos depends on helping empower teachers and school leaders to really create that climate and define what it means, what it needs to look like. A leading reason uh, that teachers leave school districts, and this is nationwide, is because of discipline issues, because they don't feel an ability to do something about it. They feel powerless and they leave urban districts. Sometimes they leave teaching altogether. The corrective side of that is that if you empower teachers to make decisions and make policies about what works best in their school environments in terms of disciplining their students, and really I prefer, as, as Rick framed it, it's, it's about building their social and emotional learning so that students from a very early age are able to cope with everything that they bring into the classroom. We have to remember that New Bedford is a city with very high poverty. There are kids who are going home to traumatic environments and bringing that back to school. And what we could do as a school committee is really be intentional about identifying resources to address that. So we can look at, as Josh said, more slots in alternative schools. We could also think about alternative schools for the elementary age so that there are places where those students can get the wraparound support they need very early so that they don't need it as they age through the school system. So I think alternative schools and building on some of the success that already is happening around teaching mindfulness, integrating yoga, these are things that I know as someone who works with philanthropy, we can resource these types of investments. So I think having a strategy and vision that incorporates enhancing the school climate is something that the school committee should lead on. Okay, so we started with you, Josh, yeah. so oh, to John. Um, stability in teachers. How can we keep the best teachers to stay here and how we recruit the best ones to come here? <clears throat> well, recruiting the best ones to come here is gonna take some change at our level here and we need to really change our leadership and we need to become more people focused people oriented student oriented not numbers oriented like we've become and MCAS and the DESE are the main drivers of that the MCAS has destroyed our educational system and so if you're not fighting against MCAS in my opinion you're not fighting for my child because that is not the way I or many of the parents, most of the parents that I speak with, want their children educated. So <clears throat> MCAS doesn't allow teachers to teach because they get to teach to a test. We need to give teachers the ability to teach. We need to establish responsibility, hold people accountable. And we need to put in a management team that actually knows what they're doing rather than this is my way or the highway that we're getting from the superintendent now we need someone who's willing to work with children who is going to have mutual respect for everybody involved right now that's the biggest problem we have is lack of respect lack of leadership and the biggest problem is ladies and gentlemen your elected officials have put our kids in this position and it has to stop we need to improve across the board it's not just for teachers it's for our children Well, again, as, as a building administrator, I mean, that is probably one of the, um, with school safety, one of the most important things we can do is the people that we are hiring. And for me, when I'm hiring a teacher, it's not always just what's in the resume, it's just also the, the gut feeling you're getting and having that conversation. We're fortunate, though, we do have a, a, a procedure in place in all our schools where there is a, um, a, a probationary period and then also within the first three years, um, there's also um, an opportunity if a teacher is not matched to what they're supposed to be doing, we can counsel them out. But our job should be how do we make sure that they're going to be successful. So questions I would have you know, for th this superintendent and the central office leadership is about their mentoring program and how that works. I'd also want to know what kind of autonomy our building administrators have over hiring teachers. I mean, when Ed reform went into effect in the early 90s, that authority went to the building principals. I mean, so is that really happening? happening because that is that is paramount that the principal know the assignment know the kids and match the person that's supposed to be in there 
Um, other concerns I have, though, is that from the central office level, is that our teachers who are new or not new, are they giving enough time when they're given a new assignment? I was talking to teachers the other day at the high school that found out at the beginning of this year that they were two days, three days before school started, their assignment completely shifted. Well, you're already now setting that teacher up not to succeed. So we need to make sure we're backing them up in that regard as well, too. So those are the areas that, that I would be concerned with and I'd want to see happen. But again, as John has mentioned, too, it does happen from the top. I mean, early on in Dr. Um, Durkin's tenure, it's my understanding that at New Bedford High School, she asked for everyone's resignation. Uh, that is unforgivable. I mean, imagine the amount of institutional knowledge that not only left, but if you're someone thinking of New Bedford knowing that at any time my resignation is going to be offered in a wide, broad net like that, that's concerning. So we need to fix those culture things within so we can get people to apply and stay in New Bedford. The interesting thing, I know in the reaccreditation re of the high school there was a concern about the certified library specialist. Let me just tell you, there are certified people out there. The problem is they just don't want to come to New Bedford right now. That's what we need to work on. Okay, Colin. Sure, so the question was how do we how retain do we, teachers? How do we retain, there's a, there is a turnover, a um, high number of turnover at the, at the school system, New Bedford Public School System. How do we kind of you know, ebb that tide and actually start recruiting some of the best ones to get to our, a good level of permanent teachers in the system? Sure, so I would say don't ask me, let's ask the teachers. And one important thing that I've found is that there is not a rigorous way of learning why teachers are leaving our district. There's no exit survey that every teacher who departs is asked to take. There's no survey of teachers just to take the pulse and see how many teachers are satisfied, how many are thinking about jumping ship. So I think a number one priority for the next school committee is to start implementing those measures to say, we can't just have conversations based on perceptions. We need to learn from the teachers themselves what is driving you out of this district, or if you're staying, why are you staying, and what needs to be true in order to keep you here? So that's number one. But number two is really back to at the point I made about discipline, that we know one of the reasons that teachers do stay is when they're empowered to be decision makers, when they're autonomous. I think of my job, and what I love about my job is that I'm given the autonomy and the respect and value of what I bring to the table to go off and implement my job how I think it's best within some parameters. Teachers are asking for that, and I think it's something we need to give them to ensure that they feel truly invested in the decisions that they can make in their classrooms. So back to the point that I think we need a vision and plan to really have a concrete direction for where we're headed as a district. Teachers absolutely need to be part of crafting that so that they can say, this is the set of progress measures that have to happen for us to feel like we are actively contributing to a better community and a place that we want to stay. Okay, Josh. Sure. Uh, well, I will say that I think there's been some very strong points made here already tonight, um, and, and there should be, because this is the number one issue in, in the election. This is the most important thing, and if I'm reelected, it will be my top priority uh, moving forward. Uh, it is worth noting that, I mean, while this is a problem in New Bedford, uh, it's worth noting that it's a problem nationally, too. Right? Not, to the, not to the extent that it is in New Bedford, but teaching as a profession is, is on the decline uh, because we're tying so many teachers' hands with standardized testing, with, um, you know, sort of like pre-cooked curriculums that we expect them to just deliver rather than, you know, embrace some creativity and, and, and really rule their classroom like, like my third grade teacher once did, you know. Um, that's on the decline nationally. Now, locally, we have some clear issues uh, around the same thing, and I think some of it starts with, with what Rick mentioned, right? When your first moves uh, in the district are to, to eliminate half of a staff and to go through another turnaround uh, process at Parker School, where I think only a handful of the 25 teachers or so that work there stayed, uh, and then you do the same thing at Hayden McFadden, the message that you're sending to people is that I see you as expendable, and I, I see you as the problem here, mm -hmm. right? Rather than just the, the failure of the entire organization, which is, which is truly what it was uh, that led to so many problems here uh, in New Bedford. I truly believe that the most impactful way uh, to, to reach a child, to, to affect their education, is to put them in front of the most qualified, motivated, dedicated teacher possible. And we have many of those best people here in New Bedford already. Uh, some of those best people have left already, which is unfortunate. Um, we need to keep the ones that we have, and we need to get the other ones back. You know, I just had a conversation the other night with um, a former New Bedford uh, administrator who uh, had told me that there's a, a kind of like a cohort, a group of 
of New Bedford educators out there who have now moved on to other districts for, for certain reasons. And uh, those folks are just waiting for the opportunity to come back here when it's right because they love New Bedford. Their heart is with New Bedford kids. Um, but how can we build an organization that embraces these people and, and builds on their talents and their, and their skills? We certainly can't micromanage them. We need to have a culture and a professional respect for all of our educators here in the district. Um, Rick mentioned some programs uh, that the district could implement. We do have some mentoring. We, we had a wellness fair just yesterday that I went to. Um, but we need to do more than just talk about it and, and pay lip service to these things. We have to, we have to be about it. We have to show people that we care about them. Um, and, and that has to happen immediately. That's a, a priority issue for us. So I'll ask a simple question and see if I get any yes out of this. Is anyone in the room for MCAS? Do you think it's a, it's a, a good system? Well, do you want us to start off just No, like just if it, is anyone for MCAS? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I have to be careful. I mean, that, that, that's for me just not a simple yes, Broad, yeah. no question. I mean. Is anyone um, as adamant as John of getting rid of it? I, I'm, I'm adamant for a three-year moratorium on it right now because when you're asking MCAS, are we saying MCAS that was the MCAS from the early 1990s that went on until before we got park? Are we talking about the new MCAS today? Are we talking about the yeah. MCAS that was paper pencil? Are we talking about the MCAS that is not in sync with the standards that we have today? So to say a simple yes or no. So today's MCAS right now in the school system, are you for it? I am not because today's MCAS in the school system is not reflective of the education standards that are in Massachusetts right now. Okay, are you, Colleen, are you, are you for the one today? Not for the one that we're currently using and that's because it tells us only about our socioeconomic status as a city. It doesn't tell us what we're doing to improve the opportunities for kids. Josh? No, the current MCAS system uh, totally oversimplifies everything that we know to be true about education. It's not a good measure for our students. Testing has some role in education. It, you know, it's worth something, but it's not worth nearly the amount of priority that we put into it. I've been up at the State House testifying on this. And I'll add, too, that uh, in my experience, I don't know that it's an issue that you can fully tackle locally. You have to go up to the state level. Mm -hmm. You have to lobby legislators. You have to get a governor other than this governor that actually uh, believes this stuff because mm -hmm. this governor is all in on, on charter schools and he's all in on standardized testing. So um, it's really a state issue and a national issue in some respects. Um, New Bedford has gotten itself into some hot water in the past by trying to make it a local issue. So you know where I stand on this, you know where the other candidates stand on this, but it's hard for a school committee to do much about it because the state has laws that yeah. make you do what you got to do. You know? Okay, so we're going to do uh, closing statements, and we're going to start with John since we, we started with Rick, so we'll go the opposite direction. Okay. Other than what I said earlier uh, about being a parent with three kids, that I want you to know what I stand for. There are no ifs and buts with me, okay? I call it as I see it. I'm not politically correct. I really don't care. I care about my children's education. I care about the education of our children in New Bedford. I'm against MCAS. I'm against Common Core. I want to get rid of Durkin. I'd like to see the mayor go. I'd like to see the other two committee members go. We need to get down to brass tacks and we need to focus on our children. That's about what it is. It's about our children, no ifs, ands, or buts. We need to look at the budget. We need to be able to cut money where we need to. We need to look at programs, see if they're working, not working. We need to transfer some of that money, get it down to the schools, and get, get that money used where it needs to be, not at the administration level. We need to stop a superintendent from having the autonomy she has because it allows the superintendent to walk all over the place. So. If you want an answer from me, just ask on Facebook, call me up, stop by my house. Um, that's where I stand. And I'd like to see every candidate stand, put out where they stand. I have no political ties. I asked for no counsel. I am doing this on my own, no fundraisers, no signs. It is just a message of education, educating our children. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Well, again, I, I thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, and I want to tell those that are listening at home uh, to realize that over the course of the night, uh, we may have had you know some back talk uh, forward and backwards, uh, but we don't really disagree on any of these issues. We're all pretty much in the same place, which for me, as someone that's been on a school committee that's largely made up of people that I haven't really agreed with on a lot of these issues over the last few years, um, it presents a really, op a really good mm -hmm. opportunity to, to get some of the things done that I've wanted to get done. Uh, because I see two new votes coming on the committee that are going to agree with me on some of these priority issues that we're talking about here tonight. And uh, that sounds really exciting. So I hope I have the opportunity to work with, with two of you. Um, 
regardless. Uh, I have a track record of making some progress here in the district, of advocating for the things that you've heard me talk about tonight. Um, I think I'm, I'm well respected in the city and in, in, in the school department, um, and I want to build on that. I want to build on that. I think that we have a tremendous opportunity here. Um, as you know, I'm, a pro, I'm pro-student, I'm pro-teacher, I am pro-community, I'm pro-parent and family, um, and, and you know we have to seize this opportunity. And I've tried to be as accessible as possible. Um, I'm on Facebook as well. My, my stances are all out there. I have a, a detailed website. Um, I'm around. I'm at a bunch of city events all the time. Um, and if anybody has any questions, they can certainly follow up with me as well. And remember, get out there and vote on November 7th. 9.4% turnout will not cut it in the, in the primary election. It's embarrassing. So we have to get out there and vote. And, not for nothing, the, the school committee election is the most important one. So, so if you have to go back and rewind the debate to pick up the things that you mm -hmm. care about, please do because it is essential that we get a strong school committee. Okay, Colleen Doki. And I'll echo that. Thank you all for watching. I think one of the things that has been discouraging in this campaign is when I knock on doors and people tell me, well, I don't have kids in the school, so I'm not paying attention to the school committee election. And that really concerns me, not just as a parent, but someone who really cares about the future of this city's economy as well. The schools are the only place where we're truly making an investment, an investment in human capital that pays off in growing our tax base, growing our economy through the creation of businesses and the growth of jobs. So I'm really just grateful that there are people tuning in tonight and people who get that the decisions we make about our kids today affect the way our city looks in the future. So I'm really fueled by a protective maternal instinct in all of this, and it really comes down to the fact that I am making a commitment to share the responsibility of raising my child and educating my child with the New Bedford Public Schools. But I need to feel confident in that commitment. I need to feel like I'm making a rational choice. And that's why I'm not waiting to get involved. I'm getting involved now because I have invested in my education and in my career and the community has really invested in my leadership. So I feel a responsibility to pay that back to the community. But I also feel the responsibility to lead a conversation about how we make this city a more nurturing place for our kids and families. There's evidence all around us that New Bedford has not put its kids first. And that evidence shows up when you see panhandlers on the street corner, when you see unemployment numbers and the number of people who aren't even in the economy. That is a reflection of our inability in the past to recognize how important it is to make that investment in our kids. So I'm really committed to changing that for the better, creating a nurturing environment for our kids, creating a collaborative environment in our leadership structure. And I think you know I'm running not just as a, a highly qualified parent who is passionate and committed to all of these issues, but I'm also running as a mom who, some of you may be surprised to know, there is no mother on the school committee. There's not even a woman on the school committee and hasn't been for some years. And it's high time that a mother has a seat at the table. So if you agree with me, and if you agree that I have the qualifications and passion to really lead our city and this conversation with a number of really passionate, committed people, please vote for Colleen DeWicke for school committee on November 7th. Okay, Rick Moore. Well, I'd like to thank uh, everyone here at New Bedford Guide and the New Bedford Guide viewers, but I'd also like to thank Colleen, Josh, and John. Um, we have gotten to know each other very well over these yeah. past couple of months, and tonight is probably the last time the four of us will be together um, in this very intimate setting before the election. So I just wanted to thank the three of them because we're putting ourselves out there, and that itself needs to be commended, so thank you for that. Thanks, Rick. This is my first step into elective politics. I have never done this before. My background has been in education. And some of what Colleen was saying about the um, board not having a woman, I was concerned that the board would not have an educator. And when I say an educator, an educator at the building level. I think in any school district, I think there's always some disconnect between central office and a building. And I feel I can bring that perspective to the table. So when things are talked about like curriculum and instructional practice, I'm working with teachers every day and PLCs talking about their, their teaching style, talking about the materials that we need to use. When we're talking about school budgets, I've worked on creating a budget with, um, with our building, with our, our, our school committee in tough economic times, and I've talked about and been, been able to create a budget that impacts students first. When we talk about school safety and discipline, that is something that I do every single day. And back a little bit to the MCAS question, we have been for the last couple of weeks looking at our MCAS data to see how that can impact our instruction. And the bottom line is, the MCAS data is badly incomplete. It is not set up right now for us to be able to impact our instruction. So that is a problem. The other reason why, uh, that I wanted to set out there is that true education, talking about children, it's not about levels, it's not about numbers, it's not about labels. It's about kids. And too many times we try to implement a business model on education because we can't simply say, what's the profit? 
You can't do it. So for me, it's not about quantitative data, it's about qualitative data. For me, success becomes, because I've been doing it for a long time, is when that 30 plus year old kid who saw me the other day at Freestones came over to introduce his fiance to me, told me he's buying a house in New Bedford, he seemed happy. The guy across the street that was cutting down the tree after the storm yelled, Mr. Porter, and came down to talk to me. That's true success. So that's why I'm running. I feel we need an educator. I feel we need that common sense voice, and I'd appreciate your vote November 7th. Okay, and I'll, um, we'll end it with this is, the school committee candidates are my favorite candidates. They're running for a job that is not paid. So these are become volunteers. Unless I don't know, you're getting paid a lot of money, Josh. And uh, yeah, I'm getting zero. We always joke about, you know, we're going to get a so, raise, right? But it's zero, zero dollars, so a so raise these, on zero. These are your candidates that are running for office, and they seem to be the most passionate, and there's no money at the end of the rainbow. Yeah. Okay, so these are the people you should commend when you see them. Um, and I want to tell you, everyone, you got to get out on Tuesday. You can actually vote on Saturday as well if, you, if you're absentee. Get out on Tuesday, 7 a.m., 8 p.m. We, we have on our website, and the city has on their, your polling locations, you can go to the Secretary of State's website, find your polling location. We give everything possible to find your location. Get out and vote. Great comments um, online. I'm sure the candidates will come in there and respond later on. But it's your duty. It's your civic duty to get out and vote. Put the right people into office, and we have great candidates here tonight. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Appreciate it.